I'm Bruce Fumi. People have been killing each other since time immemorial. We could never pinpoint the first ever political assassination. But guns haven't been around that long, have they? When do you think was the first time a head of state was assassinated by gunshot? Choose a year and whatever comes into your head right now, tell me in the comment section below. And no cheating. Who was it? Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary, Abraham Lincoln of the USA. Stop it. You know it was Scots who invented everything. And we also invented assassinations by gunshot during the life of Mary, Queen of Scots. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Today, I'm in Linlithgow to update a story that I told a few years ago when production standards were lower and it was peeing with rain as well. Now, obviously, I don't want folk to think badly of Scotland, so I decided to redo the video on murdering heads of state on a day that it's not raining, so that people don't get the wrong impression. This plaque commemorates an event that happened across the street, so where better to give the context to the story? The date is the 23rd of January, 1570. Were you close? Just under two years ago, Mary Queen of Scots and her forces had lost the Battle of Langside, and she had fatefully fled across the Solway Forth to England. The opposing side at the battle had been led by this man, Mary's half-brother, the Earl of Murray. Now, for details of the battle with maps and graphics, you can watch my video, Mary Queen of Scots, Last Days in Scotland. I'll leave a link at the end. But the battle alongside hadn't been the first time that James Stuart, Earl of Murray, had rebelled against his sister. I should probably point out that she was really his half-sister. As will become clear, he was a bit of a bastard. Their dad, James V, had numerous illegitimate children before Mary, and James wasn't her only illegitimate brother. In fact, he wasn't even the only one called James. James V had actually petitioned the Pope to ask for permission for his mistress and this guy's mother, Lady Erskine, to divorce her husband and marry James. Thus, legitimising their son and making him the heir to the throne. Now, the Pope refused, which is why James Stuart, Earl of Murray, wasn't the king. Possibly why he wasn't a supporter of the Pope either. He probably felt entitled to run the country himself. But after the King of France, his half-sister Mary's husband, died, it was James who went to France to persuade this young Catholic queen that coming back to a Scotland that was embracing Protestantism with a Taliban-like enthusiasm would be perfectly safe. You can just practice your Catholic faith in Holyrood Palace. What could possibly go wrong? James was her key advisor. She made him the Earl of Murray. He was as close to power as you might imagine possible, and he imagined he deserved. When Mary decided to remarry, James Earl of Murray decided that he should move his cat into the royal ducat. For those of you that aren't skilled at deconstructing metaphor, meow, roo, roo. Perils before swine. James doesn't like Mary's choice of husband. He stirs up trouble, rebels against Mary, flees to England and starts begging Elizabeth of England for cash to support pro-English intrigues. Now, for the your anti English brigade, remember that pro-English intrigues are also generally pro-Protestant intrigues, pro-Tudor intrigues, but mainly, it seems to me, pro-James Earl of Murray intrigues. Now, there are still some people in this country that get exercised by the whole Catholic-Protestant thing. Personally, if you are a Catholic, I'm not interested. If you're a Protestant, I'm not interested. If you're a member of a sex cult specialising in fat blokes, 
there's aspects of your faith that intrigue me, I'll be honest. I have to say though, if I was a Scottish queen brought up Catholic in France and now surrounded by scheming Protestant Scottish nobility, I might be tempted to take the logical but probably ill-advised route of relying on lower status foreign Catholic advisors myself. When one of these was brutally murdered in Mary's chamber, it would later turn out that James Earl of Murray was one of the signatories to the contract for the killing. Unaware of this, Mary forgave him, that early rebellion, remember, and she brought him back into the fold, thinking that he would be a support. When a number of nobles then agreed a contract to kill Mary's husband, James Earl of Murray, looked through his fingers. After a third ill-fated marriage to one of the nobles who may have been involved in the murder of that second husband, the Protestant lords, some of whom were also involved in the murder of that second husband, then ranged against Mary. And when she was imprisoned, who was the key winner but James Earl of Murray? When Mary escaped Loch Leven, and of course, I've got a video about how that happened. In fact, I'll leave a whole playlist about Mary you can come back to by clicking the white tab up at the top left. The point is that when she escaped, it was James Earl of Murray who led the force against her at the Battle of Langside. Now, the thing about Mary is that after the Battle of Langside, it's so easy to get caught up in following her story to England and watch her tragic tale play out, forgetting the maelstrom, a civil war that continued here in Scotland. Now, Murray was running the country, as he knew was his right. He would obviously suppress anyone who'd supported the Marian cause, and the main force that had fought for Mary at Langside had been the Hamiltons. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the Hamiltons didn't have their own Machiavellian or religious reasons for taking the stance that they did. But if you were Catholic, you'd supported Mary politically and militarily, and then our erstwhile confidant, now nemesis, had just burned down the Hamilton family castle at Rutherglen, you might have a bit of the Lee Harvey Oswald about you. Add to that a murky tale about Murray's involvement in evicting you and your wife from your own home in the middle of the night, leaving you freezing cold in your underwear, standing on a grassy knoll, and James Hamilton wanted revenge. He tracked the Earl of Murray, now head of state, to Perth, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Stirling, through the borders to York, in London, but finally, on the 23rd of January 1570, the opportunity would present itself here in Linlithgow. Now, the Archbishop of St Andrews was a Hamilton. He had a house just behind where you are in the main street, which is no longer there, but it had a balcony. How convenient! On the day in question, washing was hung up to dry, and from behind the washing, James Hamilton waited, hidden, until Regent Earl of Murray passed by. He fired a carbine, and the ball went straight through the Regent's belly and out on the other side, killing a nearby horse in its path. The Hamiltons had a fast horse waiting, and James ran out the back door and leapt in it. He hightailed it out of there with the Murray supporters in hot pursuit. As he approached a huge ditch, he was sure to be caught, but he raced his horse towards the ditch, and as he reached it, he stuck his dagger in the horse's rear, giving an added incentive to make a frightened jump, and Hamilton escaped. I'd like to say that no horses were injured in the making of this video, but James Hamilton escaped to France and you know what their eating habits are like. Back here, James Earl of Murray was taken down from his horse, but having been shot in the stomach, died later that day. There were repercussions. Several Hamiltons were imprisoned for involvement in the affair. A couple including the Archbishop of St Andrews, were hung. And James Hamilton of Bodwell Hall, the first man ever to shoot dead a head of state 
lived in penniless exile in France. Now, everyone likes a story with goodies and baddies, don't they? But whenever I tell a story about Mary Queen of Scots, there never seem to be any goodies. If you'd like to understand Mary's final fateful battle at Langside, then there's a video coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I'm a dog as can be a lamb alive. Cheery and drastic.